Good morning. I'm Morton Blackwell, president of the Leadership Institute, and it is my pleasure uh, to welcome you to this, our September Wednesday Wake Up Club breakfast. Uh, we live in, in interesting times. Uh, on the 29th of last month, the Washington Post broke the story about the 20-year-old uh, paper that uh, Bob McDonnell, Republican candidate for governor, uh, uh, wrote uh, at uh, Regent University, which was then CBN University. And they gave it considerable prominence on, on the front page. And uh, I looked at that and said, here we go again. The uh, uh, it has been prominent, that story has been prominent in the Washington Post every day since. There are today three stories uh, in the Washington Post about uh, that. Then the Washington Post, of course, has a, uh, an interest in Cree Deeds, the Democrat nominee, because uh, it's pretty clear that the Post's enthusiastic endorsement of him in the Democrat primary uh, turned things around. And uh, the uh, Cree Deeds campaign isn't doing too well uh, now in, in the polls. And we see what uh, the Post is prepared to do to protect their investment uh, already in this candidate. As I recall, it was there were stories on the Makaka incident uh, f uh, that were on uh, in the in the first section of the paper for 16 consecutive days and weeks and weeks of continued coverage. So we will see if they can make uh, uh, political uh, hay out of this. But it is interesting to watch this and. Uh, there are, I know, a fair number of, of Virginians who have sort of buyer's remorse, having um, defeated George Allen, who is one of the nicest people. And it truly was remarkable what uh, they were able to do, because those of us who knew George Allen, and I knew him uh, before he got elected to the House of Delegates um, from uh, from the uh, Charlottesville area and through his career uh, in Congress and as governor and a, as senator and those of you who knew him know that George is one of the nicest people you ever want to see. I mean he walks into the room and it lights up. Everybody's happy about it and yet the newspapers were able to make it appear uh, that he was some evil, hate-filled uh, person. And so the, the, the media does have a lot of power, and we're going to see if they can do this twice in a row in Virginia. The Leadership Institute has already trained in 2009 4,882 students, and we've held 118 of our 41 different types of schools. And since 1979, the Institute has currently trained more than 75,100 people, most of them students. And you have at your tables uh, a copy of our current 2009 school schedule. New schools are scheduled frequently. Um, so uh, uh, if there are schools of particular interest, check with us, but the currently scheduled schools are listed there and I would urge you to take a moment to review those schools and consider attending one or sending friends to one of our programs. Now my pleasure to introduce to you Eric Slee who will offer an invocation and lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Eric is currently the Director of Communications Training Department here at the Institute and there he uh, works to identify, recruit, and train conservatives from across the country. Eric was previously a legislative correspondent for Congressman Mark Green of Wisconsin's 8th Congressional District, and there he was responsible for researching and responding to issues and concerns of the constituents of the 8th District in behalf of his boss, Congressman Green. 
Prior to working in D.C., Eric served as the college Republican chairman on the campus of the University of Wisconsin Oshkosh, as well as the 6th Congressional District Coordinator for the uh, Wisconsin State College Republicans. Eric, would you come up and invoke an invocation and lead us in the pledge? Thank you, Morton. Please join me in prayer. Lord, look lovingly on this group gathered here during this breakfast as we discuss and deliberate on issues of importance. Help us to be guided by our spirit, by your spirit. May we be wise in our discernment, balanced in our judgment, and fair in our decisions. Though we may at times have differing views, may we listen to one another and be guided by our common principles. Creator and sustainer of all that is, or all that ever will be, accept our thanks for this day and all its blessings. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Please join me for the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you very much, Eric. Um, Long-time veterans of this luncheon may have noticed something that I just noticed. Um, our flagpole customarily has a nice gold eagle on top. And then uh, some few years ago, it, the flagpole obviously fell over and the eagle was damaged and for a number of these breakfasts we used the damaged eagle and it was kind of fun because the uh, the left wing of the eagle had broken off so we had an eagle here with just a right wing but it, but if eventually we, we deci decided that we would produced the whole eagle, and I notice now that it is missing, which is a mystery somebody is going to have to, uh, to solve uh, for me, and I hope that we will by next month uh, restore the whole thing to its proper uh, circumstances. Now I introduce to you Brian Burness, and he's going to give a brief report on the Institute programs. Brian is the National Field Director here at the Leadership Institute. Uh, before coming to work here, he served as the New Hampshire field director for the McCain 2008 campaign. And in addition to his work with the McCain campaign, Brian also came here with a wealth of campaign experience. He served as the field director for Tarrant for Senate campaign uh, in Vermont, campaign manager for Robinson for Delegate in Virginia, consultant uh, for the Ball for Delegate Special Election in Virginia, and on field staff for the Bush-Cheney uh, campaign in Michigan. And as part of his responsibilities as national field director um, uh, with our campus leadership program, Brian is also in charge um, of the uh, campus reform org operation which is in its beta test period starting yesterday. Yesterday the, the site is up uh, and for two weeks we'll be working out bugs on it. The public launch, which he probably would tell you anyhow, the public launch is going to be uh, September 15th and we urge that all of you go on the line at uh, campusreform.org, sign up and, and then sign up on the campuses that are of interest to you, and I, uh, I haven't conferred with Brian about what he's going to say, but I have a, f a feeling it's going to largely be about this exciting, um, massive new website. Brian Burness. As Morton stole all my thunder here, the uh, exciting uh, new project or the biggest update we probably have in the campus leadership program in the last couple of days is the campusreform.org website, which as Morton said, just did go live for beta testing yesterday. So all, a lot of you in this room who are members of the LI community and family 
uh, should have gotten an email either today, or yesterday or today, inviting you to come online, sign up, create a profile, and uh, explore the site for us. And in effect, go on there, look up whatever campuses that you might have attended, your children might have attended, um, or you, you live around, and check it out. Let us know if there is any problems with the site. But uh, most importantly, we want, want you guys to go on there, become familiar with it, so you can help us in the largest way of referring this website to your friend. We need, to, we need help spreading the word. If this, is, if this site's going to be truly successful, it needs to be spread virally from person to person, much the same way that Facebook grew among the college uh, community. Oftentimes I get asked, well, this, you know, how is this site different from uh, Facebook or something else? One of the main things about Facebook is, yes, it does have the social networking uh, community where you can have a friend and you can be in a group and everything else. Well, this takes, takes it one step further. This is where social networking meets social mobilization. We get the groups of people together, and then we go a step further and tell them what they can do to promote conservative principles on their college campuses and to fight the leftist abuse and bias um, that exists on many college campuses. So now that we've got them all together, we want to give them something to do, and that's really where this site uh, tends to shine. Very, very quickly, because I don't have a whole lot of time here this morning. It's supposed to be a brief programs update. Um, but some of the things you can do on the site. It's already making me look bad. No, I think it has a little to do with the, the internet in the room here. But one of the things that it's, it'll pull up here is there's a, there's a map of the country, and you can find out how many colleges are in, are in a particular state. There is a subsite for every single four-year college in America. I believe that number now is 2,376 okay. is the uh, number of, of subsites that are on there. Once on a subsite, you will be able to see what CLP or campus leadership program groups, the Leadership Institute already has there, or ones that other students might have organically created on their own. Uh, you can find out what these, these groups are doing on their college campus. There's a blog. There's, there's news updates um, with activity that's going on on that campus. There's a calendar of events. If a speaker's coming to campus, uh, members of the community as well as the student body can find out um, about that. On the bottom of each campus, you'll see a list of uh, liberal or biased pr uh, faculty that students, alumnus, or other people have gone in there and rated. <laughs> I wish I could show that to you now. Those are truly some great uh, comics. And finally, there's an ability for students and, uh, and faculty members and expert faculty to go on and actually rate textbooks for their bias and everything else to let other students know what textbooks uh, professors are, prescri are, are assigning and the, and the bias of those textbooks. So this is a really, really exciting project, and we could use um, all the help in the world to beta test it and as well as to promote it. Thank you very much, Brian. Uh, I am pleased to say that the donors of the Leadership Institute have responded uh, with enthusiasm and generosity uh, to this idea. Uh, we did a video uh, box mailing to 11,000 of our um, uh, larger and better donors uh, in March where CampusReform.org was the centerpiece. We also talked about the purchase of the second floor of the building next door and, uh, and our field program. But this mailing produced the, the most extraordinarily uh, successful events, uh, 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 financial results and response of any mailing that I have ever heard of, not just any mailing of the Leadership Institute, but I've uh, been involved since 1972 in a serious way with, with direct mail, and I don't know of any house file mailing of size that has ever produced results um, uh, this good, and I talked with Richard Vigury, uh, an old friend of mine and for whom I worked for seven years in the 1970s, and he has never heard of one that did this well. Seven, 11,000 letters, over 2,000 people contributed, 
in response. That is more than a 19 percent response. If you know anything about direct mail, you know those that number is unheard of. The average contribution was $695. Really extraordinary. Now, to the main event. And we really have a superb uh, speaker here, a, a wonderful person. And to introduce him, uh, I'm going to present to you Andrea McCarthy. Um, Andrea is the Director of Recruitment here at the Institute. She is responsible for developing marketing strategies uh, for us and strengthening our position as the leader in political technology training in the country. Andrea joined the Institute staff um, um, uh, as a recruitment officer in 2006. Originally from upstate New York, Andrea is an, is an uh, uh, alumna of Cedarville University, where she majored in history and political science. Andrea, come introduce our featured speaker. Thank you. Thank you, Morton. Senator Andy Harris was elected to the Maryland State Senate in 1998. Prior to his time serving in the Maryland Senate, the senator taught anesthesiology and critical care medicine at the Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine. He also served as the chief of obstetric anesthesiology at the Johns Hopkins Hospital. Senator Harris graduated from John, Johns Hopkins University with a degree in human biology. He then went on to earn degrees from both Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine and Johns Hopkins University School of Hygiene and Public Health. Senator Harris has served with the Medical Corps of the U.S. Naval Reserve since 1988. He's been a commander since 1994. So obviously with all this background in medicine, it's no surprise that while serving in the Maryland State Senate, Senator Harris has served on, among other committees, both the Education, Health, and Environmental Affairs Committee and the Joint Committee on Healthcare Delivery and Financing. Um, Senator Harris is also elected by his peers to serve as Minority Whip from 2003 to 2006. Please join me in welcoming Senator Andy Harris. Thank you very much. Good morning. Um, it's, a, it's truly a pleasure and an honor to be here at the Leadership Institute. Uh, by the way, that was a good mailing. Uh, I'm one of those uh, 2,000. Uh, it worked on me. It was, a, it, was, I, it was a great DVD. I remember putting it in and, you know, calling my kids over, having them watch that too. Um, but I've had, I've been elected in 1998. My, uh, campaign manager on my first uh, campaign, came to the Leadership Institute, my political director on this campaign, just came to a, a Leadership Institute school this past year, and we'll be back. In fact, I think he's been to two of them, and he'll be back for more. Um, and that, thank you, Andrea, very much for the introduction, and uh, you know, thank you, Morton, for all you've done over the years for the cause. Let me tell you, it's, uh, I think it's a great time to be a conservative right now. Now, I will tell you, if you had talked to me in the second week of November last year, I would have had a little different opinion. We were just finishing counting up the provisional ballots. I remember driving down to the lower shore to when I was going to give my concession a week after the uh, election, because it was a close election, and thinking, oh my gosh, you know, what's the country coming to? I had that same feeling back in 1992, by the way. Uh, which is actually the first time I actually got involved in politics. Up until then, I was, I, was, I was on the faculty. I was starting a family. We had two children. Then we have five now. Um, I remember the same thinking in 1992. And that's when I first joined my local Republican club and said, look, if the country can do this, if they can elect Bill Clinton, oh my gosh, everybody's got to get involved. I will tell you, to those of you who remember what it, what it felt like in 1992, this is the same feeling. This is the exact same thing. As I go around to places, I hear exactly the same thing. Oh my gosh, we've got to get involved. That's what we're here, seeing in all the town halls that we're seeing now. We're seeing that same attitude. So as a physician, it's particularly nice now because they're talking about my field. They're talking about health care. And that's why what I'm going to talk about uh, briefly today and then take some questions, maybe we can have a little mini town hall when we're done, because goodness knows my congressman gave up on doing them. Uh, <laughs> 
Uh, we can talk a little bit about that. But it is, a, it, it is a great time to be a physician. It's a great time to be a conservative because I will tell you, on the issue of health care right now, we have crystallized in front of the American public the difference between being a conservative and being a liberal in this country and what it means on health care. It is the, the personification of that is the public option versus what everybody's got now, or most people have now. That's it. That, that's the discussion, and we're winning it. We're not only winning it, we're winning it hands down. We're winning it to the point where you can't turn on the TV anytime, and I don't care if it's, a, if it's the mainstream media or Fox, and not see that as the main story. And it's resonating with people, real people, not AstroTurf, not the mob, not evil mongers, real people. Why is that? Because health care is the most personal thing the government has now attempted to get involved in on a huge scale. So let me talk a little bit about some of the nuts and bolts and bring some of my experience. I've uh, been, it was 30 years ago, actually 34 years ago, I guess, when I first went to medical school. I, I started my internship in 1980, 29 years ago. I've been practicing anesthesiology for 25. Half of that time I've been in the legislature for about half of that time, 11 years. So, uh, and we're a part, we're a, truly a citizen legislature, which I think is what America should be. I think that if those congressmen went back and actually had to earn a living, and had to talk with people every day, real people, in a real job, I think they'd learn a lot. They wouldn't have been so amazed by what's happening at the town halls if that's what, that's what had to happen. So first off, I'm going to talk a little bit about, about this health care reform. And my first question is to Congress or the President, what exactly is your goal? I don't get it. The American public doesn't get it. This is why they're losing it. Because one day they'll tell you, well, it's, we have to insure those uninsured. We have to do that. Those 45, 47, 120, however, whatever number they make up that day. Because they don't tell you who's in it. They, don't, you know, they forget that, oh, well, you know, the 6 million illegal immigrants. And, oh, my gosh, we're not going to you know, insure them, but we're going to insure all the uninsured. They're sending all kinds of messages. Is that their goal? Is their goal Medicare reform? Or is their goal everybody else? Not the Medicare, Medicaid population, not the uninsured, but everybody else. I don't know. It changes every day. And the trouble is, is that, when, for instance, when they discuss the uninsured and everybody says, wait a minute, there, there's six million illegals in that. I don't want to insure them. They're, oh, of course we're not going to insure them, but we're going to insure all the uninsured. Mixed message. On Medicare, we just had a health care uh, town hall held by Americans for Prosperity in the district uh, yesterday, again, because our congressman won't uh, in our part of the district. I would say the average age had to be over 60. It was predominantly Medicare. And why are they there? Because the message is, we're going we're to reform health care. And oh, by the way, we're going to save a lot of money in the process. And they're sitting there thinking, wait a minute. That's my care you're going to save the money on. Now, does Medicare need some reform? Sure, it needs some reform. We know it's going to be bankrupt. But they know the way it's going to be reformed, the way it's reformed any time. And again, I'm going to put my hat on as a legislator right now. I'll tell you right now, every time the government runs out of money, the first thing they go to, because it's a large pot, is health care. And they cut it back. They did it in Maryland. They'll do it in, they, they're doing it to uh, physicians uh, through Medicare uh, payment formulas in the congressional level and the federal level. They'll do it time and time again. And you know what? The American people have figured it out. Those Medicare folks have figured it out, citizens on Medicare. They know that they're on the chopping block. That's when, they, when the budget crunch comes. And let's face it, this has to be set in the greater setting of the budget crisis in the United States. They're not fools. You know, they tried to push the bill through. The Congress tried to push it through. They had to because they knew that if anybody thought about this for longer than five minutes in the real world, they'd put two and two together. They say, we're in the middle of a budget crisis, you're going to create a huge new program, and oh, by the way, Americans don't believe that the government getting into a program is actually going to save money. I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Uh, this is, they figured it out. So, I, and at the end, I'll make my prediction on what's going to happen, but, uh, we, you know, it's we cut to the chase. You kind of heard it in the news yesterday. The White House figured it out. They're going to have to have dramatically compromise on this. So, first of all, the objective of the, of the package is completely unclear. The second thing that, the, that people feel in their gut, but the leadership in Washington is not willing to say, is that we have the best health care in the world, period. I'm on the faculty at Johns Hopkins. 
I take care of people. I tell you, we have a connection into the Middle East. I've taken care of royalty from the Middle East. They can go. They can take their jet, private jet, and go anywhere in the world, and they don't. They come to the United States. Why? Because we have the best health care in the world. Period. We have to admit it. When I was a medical student, I, rem I will remember this till the day I die. One of my clinical, the clinical uh, folks who was teaching me clinical medicine. He went on to be a very famous medical oncologist, sat us down. He was a resident at the time. We were medical students, and it was a complicated case. And he said, you know what? Here, we are going to spend whatever it takes to get to the bottom of this patient's problem and to diagnose this problem, whatever it takes. However long they have to stay in the hospital, however many tests we have to do, that's what we're going to do. That's what Americans kind of want out of their health care system. For your family and for you, that's what you want. You want the ability to have that. Now, you may not be able to afford all of it, but you want the ability to have the option to do it. And that's what people detect is being taken away from them now. That they won't even have the option of going and saying, I want access to the best health care system in the world for me and my family. That attitude is an important attitude. It's a distinctly American attitude right now in the world. If you look at the other health care systems, it's a distinctly American attitude. We've got to keep it. Uh, finally, they haven't decided about an employer mandated not. You know, when I talk to people, and you talk to people and you very simply explain to them, you know what, the system would be much better if you owned your own insurance policy. Not your employer. It doesn't depend on your employer. Depends. I had a call, a call from a constituent just two days ago, contact from a constituent. He, he, wants an op he needs an operation. His insurance company is denying the, uh, you know, the, it on a medical necessity basis. I looked at the case. Yeah, it's probably medically necessary. But what can he do? It's his employer's insurance company. You know, if his auto insurance company treated him that way or his life insurance company, or, or he'd, he'd change them. He'd go to another one. He'd fire them. The problem is you can't fire your insurance company because it's tied to your employer in a lot of cases. The average person understands that. They all have experiences like that. And yet the government is now saying, we actually want to more closely tie insurance to an employer. Let me tell you something. The average person is thinking, they got it wrong. They don't understand, my, they don't understand what, I, what our frustrations are and what our thinking is. And as a physician, this is what I've seen. I've seen patients on the day of surgery. They come in, they, they come in, they get their intravenous, and we get a call, oh, insurance company did not, is, is not going to pay for this. And the patient's caught in the middle. It's not their insurance company. You know, they can call them, but what does the insurance company care? It's their employer who's paying the bill. They're not going to listen to them. So they haven't even figured out here about an employer. Are they going to tie it more closely or less closely? Whatever. They're not addressing what average people are thinking about. So what am I going to say? First of all, I will tell you, I believe they will completely cut Medicare out of the health care proposal. Okay? I think politically, it's crazy to put it in. If you ask senior citizens, they're generally happy with their Medicare. So why would you want to, why would you want to do it? I don't know. I'm kind of glad they had it in the initial proposal. It's, it's what got them all in trouble. But I think in the end, they're going to take it all out. Because right off the, uh, right off the block, does it need to be reformed? Absolutely. But, you can't, but, that, but it doesn't answer the question, what are we trying to do with this proposal? So I think it's going to be taken off the block. But what are some of the things we need to do that, that, that I think we leave in and we have to do? Again, is put my physician hat on. One of the reasons why Americans don't trust anything about this is because they're told we're doing comprehensive health care. We're, we're going to look at every last part of it, even Medicare. And they're going, wait a minute, um, what about tort reform? Why isn't tort reform being mentioned anywhere? Why is it off the table? Comprehensive health care reform, you're not talking about tort reform. Now, I'll tell you tort reform has two different elements. Tort reform has a cost element, clearly a cost element. But I'll tell you, it goes beyond be a cost element. Because, uh, I'll tell you, look, as an anesthesiologist, we used to be one of the highest uh, rated uh, uh, specialties to insure. It changed about... 20 years ago or so as we developed a method to measure oxygen concentration c continuously during surgery. And obviously that, that was where, where our greatest malpractice exposure was. And now we're actually among the cheapest to insure. But, the, but I work, as uh, Andrea said, I was the head of obstetric anesthesiology. Uh, I worked with obstetricians all the time. And I will tell you that aside from the cost, and the cost is huge, obstetricians would tell, would tell me they, have, they would have to pay $100,000, $110,000 for a malpractice. They would have to do literally 30 deliveries or 40 deliveries just to pay for their malpractice insurance. Now, deliveries occur any time of the day or night, as you know. Weekends, right, ladies? Any time. 
and guys who've been there, can, any time of day or night, and for, to tell an obstetrician, you know what, you got to do 30 or 40 of these, get up in the middle of the night, do it, and that's just going to start paying, that's just going to pay your malpractice bill. What do you think the obstetricians did? They left practice. They left individual practice. So aside from the economics of the added cost of that, you, had, you have what's gone on in OB that people aren't talking about now is, you know, those of you who know, who's maybe your wives or your daughters or relative of yours trying to find an obstetrician, you can't find one in private practice anymore where they're alone or they're with a partner so that when you go to have your delivery, you actually know the obstetrician who's delivering your baby. Doesn't happen anymore. In Maryland, virtually all the obstetricians have become employees of a health system or a larger practice. And now you're just a widget. And, that, and that, that's because we didn't, we didn't enact tort reform adequately. Uh, the cesarean section rate, when I first started, it was about 20, 21 percent. It was, oh my gosh, this is so high. We've got to do something about it. They did. It went down to about 17. Malpractice crisis hit. It's now above 40 percent in most major hospitals. Nobody's talking about that. It's now above 40 percent. In fact, I was practicing on, on the eastern shore, lower shore. They said their rate was 49 percent in that hospital, cesarean sections. Nobody's talking about it direct result of, tort, of, of, the ina of inadequate tort reform. So it's not just the cost, it's the way medicine is delivered. You know, and, and again, most, most women will tell you, you know, I don't want to have to have a cesarean section. I want to have, try to have natural, uh, and I want, to, I want to know my obstetrician. I want to have met them before. You know, I don't want to be part of a corporate medical practice. Tort reform is, has, the lack of tort reform has led to that. Why won't we do it? Neurosurgery, there are parts of the country where you just simply don't have a neurosurgeon. God forbid, you know, you're driving through a rural area somewhere, God forbid you have a car accident, you could be hundreds and hundreds of miles from a neurosurgeon taking an emergency call. Because honestly, they can't afford to do it. They just can't afford to do it anymore. Until you get tort reform on the docket, it's not comprehensive health care reform. You can call it whatever you want. Just don't call it comprehensive health care reform. Don't insult the intelligence of the American people by calling it comprehensive. It reeks of politics, and everybody understands that it reeks of politics. That's why they, they don't trust what's going on in Washington. But how are we going to get, how, what are we, how are we going to solve this problem? What do we need to do? We need to bring market forces into play. Americans like market forces. They like having a choice. They like going when they buy, uh, buy their, uh, anything they buy. They like a choice. They like having the information. They like price transparency. They do all the things you don't have with health care. I frequently ask an audience, because most of the people in the audience by now have had an MRI, I usually ask them, do you have any idea what that MRI cost? And do you have any idea what the range of the cost would be if you went to a different person? How many of you shopped around when you had your MRI? Nobody! Because your insurance company paid for it. It wasn't your dollar. And yet if you do call around, you'll find in most places there's roughly a three-fold difference between the cheapest and the highest cost, if you were paying for the MRI, of what, that, of what you'd be charged. Most people have no idea. They've been isolated from. Then they don't shop around. That's pretty curious. One-sixth of our economy, some of the most expensive things we buy, and we don't price shop or value shop at all. Now, there is a role for government in that. It's not price setting. It's actually giving you the information. It's, it's actually encouraging transparency. It's encouraging uh, uh, methods by which you become a, a smart consumer of medical care. And then you realize, you know, if these three MRI places all have exactly the same MRI machine and one place is charging twice as much as the other, I'm not going to that place. That's the way we do it. That's the way we buy our food every day in a supermarket. And we can buy your health care that way if you're given the price and quality uh, factors when you're, when you're looking for it. Um, in fact, I have a note here. I, I can't remember the last time a patient asked me, by the way, what, what is it costing for you to do my anesthesia care? They don't because they're not paying. They don't ask. Um, so we have to bring market forces to bear on health care purchases. And the way you do it is you, is you encourage price transparency and you encourage uh, quality information to be available, both of which can be made available, both of which can be helped by the government but not mandated by the government. Government can help provide it. Government is the largest, but largest repository, just so you know, of quality information through its Medicare records. We, they have quality information. They know how often something works and it doesn't in the hands of a various hospital or provider, and they should make that transparent. Second, you have to bring market forces to bear on insurers. 
And you can't do it the way it is now because it's not a pure market force. The market force that exists now, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take Medicare and Medicaid off the table and talk about private insurance. The market force exists between the employer and the insurer. And the employer is not thinking of, it, they think of their group collectively. So, for instance, I had a call from someone in the district two days ago, a good supporter of mine, I spoke, was speaking to him on the phone, and he owns a marina. He has about 12 employees, small business person, and he was just in the process of changing his uh, insurance to actually an HSA with a high deductible. And he was asking me, he says, well, what do you think? Should I get the HSA with a high deductible? Should we have a health, health savings reimbursement account or things like this? And I'm thinking, wow, this is, I'm, I'm flattered that he's asking me, but this is kind of interesting. Because this conversation should not be held between me and an employer. It should be held between the employee and whatever insurance company they want to buy the insurance from. Because, you see, he has to buy a one-size-fits-all or fits-none policy, whereas every one of his employees could have different needs, every single one. How many of you have seen the progressive ads on TV, the progressive auto insurance ads? Name your price and we'll give you the menu of what you can afford with that. And you know what they do is they take, you know, maybe a little bit less collision insurance, a little bit more liability. That's the way we're used to buying things. Individually, that's why Progressive runs that ad. Because that's attractive to people. You know what? It's going to fit me. It's exactly what I need. And that's not the way health insurance is purchased right now. So I will say there's one good item, at least one good item in HB 3200 in the President's plan. I think the exchange idea is a good, is a good idea. Now, not the way they plan with, with a public option, but the idea of creating a clearinghouse where every individual has access to buy into a group plan and which we can transition from employer-based insurance into individual-based insurance because once you create the exchange, it's easy. You just go to the employer and say, you know what, just have your employer, employees come to the exchange. You tell us how much you're going to pay of that and let them pick the policy. Wow, just the way the FEHBP works, the Federal Employees Health Benefit Plan works. <laughs> Funny about that. That's the one that Congress has. Oh, yeah, that's right. That makes sense. It's a great idea. That needs to be done because then it brings market-based forces into health care insurance and allows individual portability, accessibility, all the things that the person wants. That's what they want from their health insurance policy. We, we've got to do that. Um, now, we've got a, uh, the, the, so the exchange is great. Now, why, doesn't the, why won't the public option work? Because I have the fortune now that my congressman actually came out last week and said he thinks public option is a good idea. I want that debate. I want, I'm going to inform him about what public option. First of all, the problem with public option is, those of you who know that, that's creating a government run insurer, is they say, well, you know, we're going to have to work by all the rules the other companies uh, are going to have, have to work through. That's exactly the problem. You see, they're going to set the rules. And the rules are going to include things like mandates. Now let me put again, put my physician legislator hat on. We had an interesting bill about five years ago. It had to do with mandating coverage for morbid obesity surgery, what's called bariatric surgery. So people who are morbidly obese said, you know what, if you're mor morbidly obese above a certain amount, your insurance has to cover that. That wasn't the problem with the bill. The problem with the bill is it took the typical government approach. It actually prescribed the surgery, type of surgery that was to be covered. The exact surgical procedure was to be covered. Now, I actually have the opportunity, when I'm not in the legislature, to actually deliver anesthesia. I actually realized, and talking with surgeons, that that surgery was actually about to become outmoded. It was not going to be the cutting-edge surgery. It actually, there was actually a better procedure being developed and used. Within a year, it would have been better. But you know what? You see, the trouble is that the government was going to mandate and write it in the law what procedure had to be covered. So you actually were going to have to get from your insurance company the old procedure, not the new procedure, because of the way, they, because of the, way the government, because the government is not made to run health care. It's not its purpose in life. But that's the way it would have turned out. I actually defeated that bill on the floor of the Senate, and they came back next year, and they, when they finally passed the mandate, which I didn't vote for anyway, because I don't think they should be mandating anything, they actually put in better wording, which would allow them to do the best procedure, not merely the one that, that the Maryland State Legislature thought was the best procedure at that moment in time. That's the way the government works. It's, it's, a, t it's a terrible way to run. Obviously, the public option, by setting the rules, just like they say, you, you can't have the referee play in the game. That's what it would do. And again, when I talked to this employer, this, this marine owner yesterday, he said, look, they put that public option, and I love my employees, but I'm out of uh, buying, them uh, buying them insurance because, face it, 
that marina owner is not an expert in buying health insurance or health care. They don't want anything to do with that, and they will get out of it at whatever opportunity they get, whether it's an 8% payroll. In his case, he has low-priced low employees, so an 8% payroll tax is actually attractive to him. What does it do? It gets everybody into the government option, into the public option. That, that is the, fu the Having the public option available, merely available, will, by the rules of the game, drive everyone into it. And my point is you don't want to be in public option. Why don't you want to be in a public option? Well, because for one thing, they do things like those stupid mandates. The other thing is, let's look at how the, oh, the, uh, the biggest publicly run system right now is Medicare. Two times in the last month. I was working with a uh, podiatrist the other day, and uh, he, we, we were doing an operation uh, surgery for a bunionectomy. And I thought it was a little strange because it was done at the inpatient. It was done as an inpatient at the hospital when I knew there's an ambulatory surgery center. And I was having lunch with him later, and I said, by the way, why did you, why'd you do this at the inpatient hospital instead of the, instead of the ambulatory surgery center where the costs are lower, it's much better for the patient, you know, you're not coming into a hospital, you're just coming to an outpatient surgery center. He says, oh, because Medicare won't pay for the prosthesis I put in, the $900 prosthesis, unless I do it in an inpatient hospital. Who in the heck down the road here thought of that? I mean, this is a procedure done under light sedation with, a, with literally local anesthesia. It's a $900 prosthesis, and you probably cause the patient and the healthcare system, patient inconvenience of having to come to the hospital, healthcare system, additional cost of doing it in, in, a, in a hospital setting because somebody decided Medicare was only going to pay for that prosthesis if it was put in in a hospital. And then the guy said, look, the ambulatory surgery center director said, we'd love to do these cases here. It's a perfect case to do here, but they can't eat the cost of that prosthesis. That's what happens when you have the government making health care decisions. It happens all the time. Ran into, I was in church uh, Sunday. One of the ushers comes up to me, makes a point of coming up to me, saying, well, I hope you're running again. You know, I've got to tell you, I had, he had Guillain-Barre syndrome a few years back. The treatment was $17,000 for the drugs. They would only pay for the drugs if he, if he had the treatment as an inpatient. Medicare rule. Go, who, who is sitting around making up these rules? Certainly not the, the patient. I mean, he, he didn't want to go into a hospital to get this when it could be done as an outpatient, but it had to be because Medicare was making up the rules. This is why the public option is bad. Everybody realized the government will never, ever, ever run anything as well as a, as a well-run free market private sector because that's what everybody's used to, well-run well free market private sector. Uh, a couple of quick points, and then I'll, I'll take some questions. We've got to change the tax deductibility rules. That goes with all of it. You got to, you, we have to get away from it tying insurance to an employer, and the tax deductibility rules tie insurance to an employer, because they're the only ones who can tax deduct. So we've got, we've got to take care of that. Uh, as I've, as I've kind of suggested, we've got to go to encouraging and a, a return to the concept of insurance, the original concept, which is insurance is for catastrophic things happening, okay? We've got to get what I call the oil changes out of the insurance system. What do I mean by that? When you go to a family practitioner, the family practitioner is going to charge you $50, $60 for an office visit. The insurance company will only pay them $25 or $20 but they have to send a bill for that 25 or 20 and then they got to code it and they got to justify it. I was in, again down on Lower Shore in this kind of mini town hall meeting with 10, with 10 or 12 uh, primary care physicians and their spouses and I asked one of them at the end and he was an Obama supporter and I, I, I asked him, uh, it's kind of uh, just to the side, I asked, and he, was a, he was an internist, small practice, two internists, nurse practitioner, don't do a whole lot of procedures, they just, they're basically family practitioners, you know, health, primary care providers. I shouldn't say family practitioners. I said, by the way, what's your back office cost? What, is it co what does your back office cost you, the billing part of your practice? And he said, oh, he says, we are really low. He says, ours is only 48%. 48%. Because they don't do big procedures. They don't send out $1,000 bills. They send out $30 bills and $40 and $50 bills. And to collect on that literally cost them one half of what they're collecting. Now I looked them in the eye and said, half, think about this, 48 cents out of every dollar, health care dollar going through your office isn't providing health care. It's because you've got you to do some billing somewhere. And that includes Medicare too, by the way. You know, the greatest myth in the world is that Medicare has 2 to 3% overhead. <laughs> do you know why they're claiming, uh, oh, how many people have heard that? Come on. Liberals all the time. Oh, we got to go to a Medicare, only 2 to 3% overhead. Let me tell you where all the overhead exists. It exists in that doctor's back office. 
That's why Medicare has successfully transferred all the overhead costs to the health care providers. Go into your local hospital and ask to see the business office part of the hospital. You'll be amazed at how large it is. Why? Because they've got to they do paperwork. Okay? So that, that's blown. But if you take out the lower price things, if, we didn't, if, if people didn't expect their insurance company to pay for the, for the $50 office visit, which, by the way, if you paid cash, would only be $25, because every physician would say, oh, my gosh, if you give me cash, I'll charge you much less. Strangely enough, according to some rules with some insurers, you can't charge less for cash. Bizarre, huh? Because if you go to a store or you go to a gas station, some of them give you a discount for not using that credit card. Can't do it in, uh, with some insurance contracts. In some states, you can't do it because an insurer can go to a physician and say, you can't charge anyone less than what you charge me. Parentheses, even if they're paying cash. That's bizarre, okay? That's not, that's not a free market system. So we've got to go to, to a catastrophic high deductible coverage with HSAs, make them roll over, because if you, roll, if, you allow, if you allow them to roll over, the patient, the patient has the incentive not to spend every dime. I'm telling you, I'm coming up to the last 10 days on my health reimbursement account. My, I still have $600 left. I already had the discussion with my wife. Look, go buy, go buy $600 worth of stuff because I paid that money. I want it back. If, if you just allowed it to roll over, you don't have that discussion. Healthcare system would save $600 this next, this next two weeks in the Harris family. <laughs> Finally, we have to say point blank, and this goes to a larger subject, you can't cover illegal immigrants in this country. You just can't do it. Do you have to provide health care in an emergency? You sure do. But one of, the be one of the best ideas a few years back, which failed, was that, you know, MTALA, the, the, the law that says if you go to an emergency room, you have to get coverage. And that's right. God forbid any human being in this country in an emergency has to get coverage. But you know what? I think that hospital has the duty, if the taxpayers are ultimately paying for that care, to s report to the government whether that person is here illegally or not. That's all. Take care of them. Take care of them, but then tell the government, oh, by the way, we took care, we patched them up, we took care of this person, but they're not here legally. That's the way it ought to be. Because, you know, this is a country of law. The law is pretty clear. We're a country of compassion, too. Do I say no? No, take care of them. Take care of them. But then report them. And then, you know, let, let the law take its course. The very last thing, technology. We have got to, the president's right about something. He's right, uh, he's not right about, you know, tests being repeated five, six times. But he is right that what happens is we are, we, we're used to going to several providers, from a primary care provider to a specialist and perhaps to several specialists, and the records have to travel in very antiquated ways from one person to another, and they don't have to anymore. Every person could have, you know, a flash drive that has every single test ever done in their life, every single x-ray ever taken, every single EKG digitized on it, which you can carry around in your pocket. You go from provider to provider, and they plug it into their machine, and they see all your tests. They know, never have to repeat one. They know your entire medical history better than the average person could relate it. That has a role, but not mandated by the government, not controlled by the government, and heaven forbid, not with that data held by the government, because that's what was suggested. The government become the clearinghouse. You know, I don't need the government to be clearinghouse. We have the technology. Every person could be their own clearinghouse for that day. They could possess that data. So the government could incentivize that. It could say that under insurance rules that you will, you will pay a lower premium if you agree to do this and then provide a platform. Just like they, the exchange is a platform the government provides, they could provide a technology standard. Not, again, government run, but they, they could... Um, uh, standardize the technology so that every provider could talk, it, it, they'd understand when they plugged in that flash drive what, what, what was on it. The format was, was, would be identical. That's, the va that's a valid function of government because, the, you know, each insurance company doesn't have a reason to do it. The insurers don't have a reason to do it. People don't have the collective uh, ability to do it. Uh, so you, you might need a nationwide standard. But again, not with them controlling the data, with you controlling the data and not mandating the use, but saying incentivizing the use. Uh, that, that's, that's appropriate. So anyway, those are my thoughts on, on uh, again, it, with, with my experience both as a physician and a legislator and with what's been going on with health care. Those are my thoughts of where we need to go. And fortunately, we can, we can drive this discussion a little because, again, my prediction is there'll be a bill because I've been in legislature long enough to know when the chief executive wants a bill, there is a bill. And it'll say health care reform at the top. And it's probably not going to say much after that. I mean, they might deal with pre-existing conditions, maybe lifetime uh, uh, limits and caps and things, and they'll give the president something. He can pat everybody on the back and say, good job. 
and then nothing will be done until after the 2010 election. Then everybody, I think the message in Washington is, whoa, you know, we have to see what, what 2010 brings. And I will tell you, if the election were held tomorrow, 2010 would bring an environment where we can start talking about the real free market principles to really reform health care, to make it even more distinctly American than it is now. Thank you very much. Well, the senator has uh, agreed to take some questions, and uh, if you would, raise your hand. We've got people with mics, and uh, <coughs> you can choose whom you wish. This is a... Ma'am, go ahead. Okay. Um, you talked about market forces and giving information and then looking at price and quality, and the quality came down to the what was provided as far as the test. What about finding the quality of the server, the doctor, the physician who's giving the test? Because sometimes that becomes an issue. And that's been very hard for consumers to get that information. Absolutely. But as I suggested, that information is all, is all, is all relatively available. I mean, Medicare has, can link. Uh, now, again, it's only, it, it, right now, the data only exists for the Medicare data set, which is above 65, and, and of course, people with renal disease and things. But uh, that data set could exist for people above 65. For instance, you know, they, they obviously link diagnoses to providers to outcomes or complications and things. That data could exist. And the government could become a way of developing, again, the methodology to provide quality data. Not possessing it, not, not necessarily them doing but to provide the, the way to do it. So, for instance, encourage insurance companies to share that kind of data with each other through some common system. Because each insurance company, for instance, has some idea. For instance, if you have a, uh, and you know, the coding is very specific. Let's say you, ha you went to the hospital for coronary artery disease bypass graft, okay? One of the most commonly performed procedures in the United States. They know, your insurance company knows exactly what complications you had and exactly how long you stayed in the hospital. And they can link it to the hospital and the surgeon who did the, who did this, the, uh, the surgery, obviously. Now, we have Medicare data, but the data set could be much larger. It could exist from all insurers who cover it. And again, so, so encourage insurers to share that kind of information in a data set that then could be made available to the public. I mean, it, it would be the consumer reports of medical care. Now, I, I don't know. I like to do that before I go to buy. I like to go see what other people... Now you click on the Internet, you can read all kinds of opinions about everything. You've got to do it for medical care also, because price is not enough. Our decisions as Americans are always price quality. They're value decisions, which is price and quality. And we can't do that with medical care right now. Sure. Could you, could you talk a little bit about preventative care? I'm, I'm, I'm thinking, yes. I'm thinking on the one hand of things like needle biopsies and mammograms, which I guess have been a little discredited. And on the other hand, uh, we hear lately about vitamin D and vitamin C and, and the ability to uh, prevent stuff from ever happening. That, that, that's a great point. I'm, I, it was on my notes, but I know I was going over my time. Whatever system you have, you have to allow for the, uh, for the encouragement of preventive care that works. Okay? Now, you bring up a good point about uh, breast cancer, for instance. Uh, you know the news circulating in the last two days is we actually do a lot of screening, and sometimes the screening actually leads to more problems than the original process. So, for instance, now they're talking about, you know, uh, for instance, there was trend to whole body MRIs and whole body CAT scans and things. But now you find out, well, you know, there, there is some radiation in a CAT scan. And you don't get the tumor uh, the next day. You get it 10 years down the line or something. So there's a, there's, in your mind, there's a disconnect. In people's minds, a disconnect. But even more importantly than that, some very intriguing, and I'll, t I'll talk about breast cancer only uh, uh, specifically because I work with a lot of the, the uh, cancer surgeons at Hopkins. Because there's some very controversial data that shows that we actually detect cancer earlier with all the breast cancer screenings we're doing, but the, survive, the, uh, cu the ultimate fatality rate from can breast cancer is exactly the same as it always been. And the medical explanation is, is that, you know, your body, through its immune system, is probably constantly destroying mutated cells. It's, pro it's constantly recognizing mutated cells as foreign cells and destroying them, and occasionally it doesn't recognize some and they grow to be a tumor. And the question is whether or not we're detecting some tumors when the body would have destroyed them, when they're so small, so localized, the body would have gone on to destroy them. So, we're, so that's an intriguing 
that, that you know, there's some types of cancer. And when I talk to the surgeons over this, I talked to one over, over the ether screen in the operating room just a few weeks ago. Their explanation is, yeah, for some types of tumors, that's, that might be true. So we have to, when, when, you, when someone says, oh, you know, we've got to pay for all this, you know, the, the data coming out is actually, you know, from a cost point of view, uh, it, may not be, it may not be as effective as we think. But we do have to incentivize, immunization is a perfect example. Obviously, immunization, immunizations for diseases that could be devastating in childhood, for instance, polio and things like that. You have got to develop a system where the patient's not saying, gee, uh, you know, I, if I spend this out of my pocket, uh, it's less money that I have. So, for instance, when you set up a health savings account, you have to, I think, cordon off part of it for preventive medicine and immunizations and say, you know, that has to be spent. There's an incentive to spend that money. You have to provide an incentive because there's a financial disincentive otherwise. But you can create a plan that does that. Who's got a microphone? Oh, it's... A question on tort reform. I know states can uh, pass their own laws for tort reform. My question is, uh, the national scene, uh, President Bush and Tom DeLay owned this town for six years. As I recall, they didn't pass any tort reform. Yeah. Any explanation as to why? And is there any state in the union that has excellent uh, tort reform in the medical uh, area that you're aware of that could be uh, copied elsewhere? Yeah, absolutely. It's a, it's a great question. I know I was in Bill Frist's office and asked him that question about the... Well, I guess about three, four years ago now, when, when he had introduced the bill in tort reform, and his, uh, oh yeah, he introduced, the, there, were, there was a tort reform bill floating around the legislature, for uh, Senate, for two years, and his frustration was he could never get the 60 votes on the floor to advance it. But the bill was drafted, it would cover, I believe they, it covered OB and neuros, I think it, and maybe emergency room. It only covered several, a few specialties, but there was a federal bill. Now, you put your 10th Amendment hat on and say, well, should the federal government be involved in it? I'm not going to get into that discussion. I will tell you the tort reform is effective at lowering costs uh, to some extent. And, e again, tort reform is two things. It's not only cost, it's access to providers. And that's important because, it, remember, it's not only price, it's quality. You always want price and quality. It'll not only positively affect the price, it positively affects quality, so it's a win-win. Yeah, California, back in the medical, the original medical malpractice case 20 years ago, passed some of the best tort reform. Most recently, Texas. I was just down in Texas uh, last week, uh, again, speaking to a group of doctors. They can't license doctors fast enough in the state of Texas. <laughs> they can't license them fast enough because of tort reform. Yeah. Uh, thank you. When I uh, speak to my liberal friends talking about the need to socialize medicine, the one statistic they often throw in my face is in Canada and the United Kingdom, uh, health care costs 50% less than it does in this country, and yet 100% of the population is covered. Uh, my question is, is that true? And if so, what is the conservative response to that? Uh, look, I, I know many people, we have a lot of physicians actually who came from, uh, who come from uh, both the UK and other countries around the world to Hopkins to do fellowships and things. Uh, sure, did they spend less? Uh, yeah, they also engage in far less risky behavior in, uh, in some of these countries. Uh, they, have, they don't have the sophistication we have, and they don't have the ready access. The bottom line is it's the ready access. And I uh, forget the name of the, uh, the person who uh, had the skiing accident and died up in Canada, but it was because there really wasn't a CAT scan close by where you could diagnose the subdural hemorrhage early and tap it and, and cure the person. Uh, sure, can you, can you do it on the cheap? Yeah, you can do it on the cheap. You could drive a Yugo around. The streets aren't filled with Yugos either. Uh, there's a reason why. And, when, and it's funny, when I, when I tell people, you know, you don't want, you know, I, on, the, on the car issue, I said, you know, there's only, there's, really in recent history, there's really only one car company. It was a state-owned car company where they tried to sell cars in the United States to some extent because British Leyland, I think, was owned by the government, but su subsequently sold private. It was the Yugo. I mean, come on. We, it's not like this, these ideas haven't been tried. Yeah, you could do it on the cheap, but it doesn't work. The waiting time for an orthopedic uh, procedure, for instance, to, to get treated by an orthopedic surgeon in Canada is 25 weeks. Now, you tell someone who has an acutely bad hip, whose hip got acutely worse, that they got to wait a half a year. I'll tell you, I'll, I'll put my Navy doctor hat on. I was in the Navy for, uh, for 17 years. Um, we used to have, uh, I was in the reserve, we used to go to Bethesda and do arthroscopies, anesthesia for arthroscopies. We were told that the Navy had a backlog of 450 arthroscopies. We're like, okay, so 450, so we'll, we'll, we'll get through, and we did about 20 a weekend. But they said, but the interesting thing is, all those people are on limited duty until they get their arthroscopy. 
Well, that's interesting. Nobody's talking about that. Because, you see, if you're waiting 25 weeks to see that orthopedic surgeon for arthroscopy, you're not being a productive part of the economy for 25 weeks. Nobody's mentioning that, that little cost. Because that's not a direct health care cost. That's an indirect cost. That's the indirect cost of waiting 25 weeks to see an orthopedic uh, surgeon for something. And, and, and that's a true cost. It's not only a personal cost. Because in, you know, in, in that case, that person has a little knee pain, they're not working. But in the case of someone who's waiting for a hip replacement or a knee replacement, they're suffering pain for 25 weeks that might be unnecessary. Sure. It's actually uh, kind of funny that you talk about orthopedics. I actually have a uh, fractured uh, fibula, and uh, I've, I've been getting around on crutches lately. I found out, you know, you, you said, you know, people have to wait all that time for orthopedic surgery. Well, I actually only had to, I had to wait less than two weeks before I got surgery on my, on my bone. And I found that if I'd had to wait for longer, they'd have to go back in and re-break the bone. And, they'd ha and that would increase the chances I'd have to be hobbling around, walking in pain, until they were actually able to do that. And so I'm actually fortunately having this cast off in a very short amount of time, and I'm very happy about that. But um, what I wanted to say was, you know, I'm with you in, case of, in the case of no, we need to not change things to where we have to wait for longer. But I'm, I'm wondering, where's the, where's the thing that we can all rally behind? Because we have a lot of people right now that are against this health care package, against giving the government control of this. Where, how can we rally for something, for some of these changes that you proposed? Like, what kind of format can we see that in? How are we going to be able to get around something and support something like that? Well, you can, you can support it. What you can do when you've got, you know, 70-plus uh, you know, vote margin in, in the House and a filibuster-proof Senate and a, and a Democrat for president you know, what you, what you can do and what you can support are two very different things. I don't think you can do very much, except, you know, stop whatever's there now, and then after the 2010 election, realistically, that's when you, I think you can, do, you can do things. What should we support? Tort reform. The other thing everyone should talk about, every conservative, libertarian-minded person should talk about individual ownership of an insurance policy. That's it. It's individual, and it's not a government insurance policy. They should talk about that. How are we going to get to me owning my insurance policy? Nobody else. It's designed by me, paid for by me. You know, I'm the one, or, and with help from my employer, if you have an employer, they'll help you with it. But we're, we're, it's personal possession. We have, to, we have to put it in those terms. Those are the most successful terms, I think. I will tell you about, uh, again, about the delays. I talked to one of the uh, pediatric urologists at Hopkins, world famous for constructing uh, boys who are born with uh, a bladder extrophy, where the bladder is not quite, uh, you know, the waterworks aren't quite made quite right. Uh, he went up to Canada and he talked to some of his colleagues and they said, oh yeah, we, we, you know, the government pays for it all, but sometimes you've got to wait till, you know, two or three years to get on the schedule. And his point was, that's great, but it's a much more complicated operation in two or three years. It'll get done. It's a much more complicated operation. It's like you said, yeah, your leg will get fixed. It's just more difficult and less chance of it, of it actually succeeding. Because we have the best health care in the world here. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Senator Harris. Uh, what, a, uh, what a remarkable and interesting presentation uh, you made. You came very close last year to, uh, to being elected to, be elected, uh, uh, to Congress, and it, it may turn out differently. We always learn uh, new things and questions arise. Uh, one thing which has occurred to me that I need to look into is just who are these liberal friends that Dan Whitfield has? <laughs> but uh, but uh, in, uh, in any case, as a token of our uh, appreciation, I want to present you one of our Leadership Institute Adam Smith ties. Well, thank, thank, thank you. you. Very much. I invite you all to join us on Wednesday, October 7th. <clears throat> Our uh, Wednesday Wake Up Club breakfast uh, speaker at that time will be former Secretary of the, uh, the U.S. Navy, Dr. John Lehman, a, uh, an outstanding fellow and a good friend of mine. And I invite any of you who are interested in a tour of the Leadership Institute to meet with Seth Nichols. Seth, walk on up here so they can see who you are. Seth will be happy to... Uh, um, to take any who are interested on, on a tour of the building. Uh, thank you very much.